morning it, uh, seemed to all go along with the uh, sermon text this morning. I wanted to spend a little more time on uh, Thanksgiving, and man, there's just so much. The Bible is filled so full of uh, Thanksgiving, and uh, we will not meet again except tonight uh, before we have a celebration of uh, Thanksgiving season, a uh, day that is put on our calendar of Thanksgiving, and there's just uh, so much uh, that uh, could be said for Thanksgiving. I'm going to the book of Ephesians. I know we just studied this on Wednesday night, just a few weeks ago, Ephesians chapter 1, uh, the longest verse in the Bible, but I'm not going to even try to attempt to get through uh, all of that uh, verse uh, from 1 through 14. Uh, I'm not going to try to get through all of that, but I'm going to read verses 1 through 9 and uh, really spend most of the time uh, 3 through 9 and uh, really 3 through uh, 7. Uh, there's just a lot to be thankful for, and I don't know who the uh, put the headings of uh, the beginning of the book in my Bible, but I'm going to read uh, just a little bit that he says just to kind of get uh, your thoughts on Thanksgiving this morning in the book of Ephesians because the book was written to include the Gentile race into uh, the plan of salvation. And uh, the author, whoever wrote this, said Ephesians is, is addressed to a group of believers who are rich beyond measure in Jesus Christ, yet living as beggars, and only because they are ignorant of their wealth. Paul begins by describing in chapters 1 through 3 the contents of Christian's heavenly bank account. Now think about that. Christians, you have a heavenly bank account. And sometimes we don't even think about that. This is some of the things that he says, and again, this is just a writer that is writing some things before the book of Ephesians. This is not God spoken, so I'm not even pretending that it is. Uh, but I thought he had some real good points uh, about the bank account. He said this is what's deposited in your Christian bank account. You are adopted, you are accepted, you are redeemed, you are forgiven, you have wisdom, you have an inheritance, you have the seal of the Holy Spirit, you have life, you have grace, you have citizenship. In short, every spiritual blessing is in your bank account. I don't know about you, but that is a pretty good bank account. That's something to go into Thanksgiving on Thursday was something to be thankful for. No matter what your circumstances are, go into Thanksgiving being thankful for what you have in Christ Jesus. And you're going to see in Christ Jesus quite a few times in this passage of Scripture. If you can comfortably stand, please do so. If you can't, please feel free to remain seated. Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to read the first nine verses. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in, in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Christ Jesus to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, 
to the praise of the glory of His grace by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, which He made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure which He purposed in Himself. Take a moment, let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart, prepare he, your heart for His Word. Heavenly Father, as we bow in your presence this morning and as we look into Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus, knowing that he was bound and in prison and probably in chains, writing to a church to encourage them, how encouraged we should be to know that under these circumstances he was still dishing out words of encouragement under the anointing of being spoken to by God to encourage this church. I pray, God, that you would right now move among us, Father, after the praise and the worship that we've heard from the praise team and the congregational singing. We should be enthused. We should be excited. We should be willing to praise you, to honor you, to glorify you, to be moved by the presence of your Holy Spirit because of who we are in you. We should be excited that we have enough time to worship you here this morning. And I pray for a move of your Holy Spirit among our people here today, Father, that they would prepare their hearts and their minds to receive your word, to be moved by your word, to be spoken to by your word. Father, if there's anything in hearts and lives that needs to be moved out of the hearts and lives that would interfere with a relationship with you, I pray that this would be the time that that cleaning would take place, that cleansing, that purification, that sanctification would take place in their hearts and in their lives. Pray if there's someone that don't know you that this would be the time that your Holy Spirit would draw upon their hearts, that God, that you would call them by name, that you would call them into the fellowship with you and that they would submit into that call and that drawing of the Holy Spirit that they would accept Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. I pray that your word would go forth, that it would be, go forth as God being speaking to this congregation of people. I pray that there would be an ear that would be receptive to it. I pray for an anointing upon uh, this body, these lips, this mind that I would have a spiritual ear to hear and to understand what you would want me to say. And God, I pray for an anointing for this time that you would speak, that it would not be me, that it would not be any part of me that would be speaking, but you would take complete control of me. And God, that you would move in this service, that you would have your way. In Jesus' precious holy name I pray, amen. As we look at Paul's writings, here in the book of Ephesians. Paul starts out a, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And as we look and think about the time of Thanksgiving coming up and how do we get out of the commercialization of Thanksgiving how do we withdraw? Am I saying that we should cancel all family activities and not have any family activities? I'm not saying that at all. I think we should have the family activities, but I think we should take Jesus into the family activities that we are having. I think that Jesus has been commercialized out of the family activities. We get caught up into the hustle and the bustle and making sure that we have enough of the pumpkin pies and enough of the turkey and enough of the ham and enough of all of the other stuff that we forget about Jesus because we are so 
wrapped up in all of the other things and we got to make sure that all of the carnal things are taken care of that we forget that we need to thank God for who we are and what we are in Him, Christ Jesus. Paul is taking time here to speak to a church in Ephesus that as the writer has said uh, and before we get to the book of Ephesus that he was saying that these people are living as beggars and they are spiritually, they have a bank account that is loaded with goods that is in the bank account that is in their name they are entitled to, they have access to that they are not using in their everyday life. I wonder what Jesus could do if each one of us took time out in our Thanksgiving festivities if we did nothing more than just maybe moved over and sat down somewhere or stood somewhere and thought about someone in our family that we wasn't sure about their relationship with Jesus Christ and offered up a silent prayer that God would minister to them that we could say something, that we could do something, that we could act in something some way that would reflect Jesus Christ to them and that the Holy Spirit could use something in our life that we could be a laborer for him to use during the time of thanksgiving rather than just being so caught up in all of the festivities of thanksgiving that we never give him any room for anything. Paul was spending time to these people saying, listen to me, you have so much to be thankful for. You have so many resources available to you in your bank account that you need to be using. And he starts listing all of these things. He said, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and I'm writing to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Jesus Christ. Verse 2 says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I'm not giving you anything that is carnal. I'm asking for grace and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now verse 3 starts in and starts getting into the deepness of these verses. He said, Blessed uh, be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. How in the world, are, that word blessed just means good tidings to you or thanksgivings to you or praise to you. And what is he saying? Who is he saying should get the praise or the goodness to or the thanksgiving to? Be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who is the one in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. How much credit does God get during a Thanksgiving season that God, I want to thank you for the love that you had uh, that after Adam and Eve sinned in the garden uh, and were put out of the garden because of sin uh, and the relationship between me and you were broken uh, and all of the law and all of the the sacrifices that had to be made and all of the animal sacrifices and all of the judges uh, and all of the kings through the Old Testament that God you love me enough uh, that on Christmas day you sent your son Jesus down here uh, to live a life of 33 years uh, to give his life. God you be blessed. You be praised. I want to thank you on Thanksgiving day. Uh, and give you some honor and you some glory. Uh, and even if the turkey don't all get eat, and if it uh, does get all get eat, and somebody don't get some turkey, I still want to give you some praise. Uh, but we get so wrapped up in all of the things of the world. Uh, and all of the things of the Black Friday, and am I going to get there early enough to get the big TV set that I want? Am I going to get there to get the, the big whatever? And that don't even count anymore because Black Friday sales, that, my phone's just been blowing up with Black Friday sales from Best Buy. 
for two weeks now. It's not even a Black Friday sale anymore. It's a Black Month sale, I guess, or a Black Three Months. I don't know. It just we have we have just took it from one day to three days to five days to a month, and and it, it's just a way of getting us away from focusing on the things that God intended for us to focus on and that be for him to be honored and glorified and praised. And it's easy today to think about it, but wait till Wednesday gets here and wait till crunch time gets here and wait till the family starts coming in and then Satan, I promise you, he's not going to be lazy about it. Uh, he's going to get your mind to rolling. Have I got everything together? Do I need to get some more stuff together? Am I going to have enough of this? Am I going to have enough of that? Am I going to have this covered? Am I going to have that covered? Am I going to have everything together? Is everybody going to be took care of? And we get sucked in uh, to the world's desires and the world's overwhelming and, and hey we're going Friday morning and we're going to do this and we're going to do that and the first thing you know you get sucked in uh, to all of the things that is going on and the first thing you know you wake up next Sunday morning and you say you know what I went through the whole Thanksgiving season and I didn't give God thanks for nothing uh, is that not the way that Satan works uh, Blessed, give God the praise that he deserves, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Who has blessed us with ever spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He was trying to get the Gentiles to realize you've been accepted. You know who you are today? You know who I am today? We're a Gentile. We got accepted in. You know, I believe it's in 1st or 2nd Timothy that he said, I believe this is the terms that he said, in the latter days there's going to come some perilous times. And one of the things that he said he said there was going to be a great fall in a way, but if you just keep reading along those lines, one of the things that he said was people were going to be unthankful. Do you not think in this world that we're living in today that this is one of the mo not one, this is the most unthankful, ungrateful generation that you've ever lived in? And when it comes to spiritual things, to give God the praise for what he done when he hung his son on the cross after he had begged him three times, Jesus, there in the garden three different times, Father, if there's any way possible to save those mankind down there at Copper Spring Baptist Church, if there's any way possible, possible to save them from their sins without me going to the cross and dying on the cross and being beat unrecognizable please let it be but he finished all three prayers with nevertheless let your will be done and not mine if there's no other way I'll go hang on the cross and guess what he did he went to hang on the cross and we live our lives like you deserve to go to the cross, you needed to hang on the cross, I'm worthy of everything that you did, I'm worthy of every stripe you took, I'm worthy of the nails, I go to church, I put my ties in, you just need to hand me my ticket to heaven and I'll be there. Is that not the way the world lives today? Everybody that dies is going to heaven. Use every kind of language. I'll go to church when I get ready to go to church. And if I don't want to go to church, I'm not going to go to church. If I want to read my Bible and try to get closer to God, I will. But if I don't want to, I won't. I go to church less now than I've ever went in my life. And I intend to continue on in that lifestyle. That's what I intend to do even though God has blessed me with every opportunity to go to church that there is. I don't intend to change my lifestyle. 
But yet I'm thankful, God, for whatever thing you've done. Yeah, words are cheap, aren't they? What does your lifestyle show Jesus? Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Let's look at verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. I know this is Calvinistic scripture, but it's very plain. God chose us, the first he, he is God, chose us in Jesus before the foundation of the world. That's plain and simple, and that's not Calvinistic that some are chosen and some are not. All he said is, I chose you, and the only way you're going to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. You'll not get there any other way. You can slice it, dice it, any way you want to do it. And I praise God for that verse. Because I can tell you now, if I had to work and be good enough to get to heaven, I'd die and go to hell, and you would too. If I had to go to church enough to get to heaven, I'd die and go to hell. And you would too. But because God chose His Son to be the perfect man and to shed His blood to cover my sins and to resurrect Him from the dead and set Him at the right hand of the Father to intercede for me, that's the only chance that I've got to go to heaven is because he chose us in him in Jesus before the foundation of the world that we us we should be holy and without blame before him God in love that's the only chance that we have and that's through Jesus Christ have we got something to be thankful for come Thursday have we got something that needs to be implanted in our brain come Thursday to be thankful for that God chose us in Christ Jesus under the blood of Jesus that I could be holy, that I could be without blame, that I could be in him, in love before God when I stand, when this life is over and when I stand before him, that I can stand before him. Can I get up Thursday morning and say, thank you, God, that I am in Christ uh, and that I can stand holy before you, that I can stand without blame before you, I can stand in love before you only because of your son, Jesus Christ, Thank you today on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, no, people don't want to use Thanksgiving Day for that, do they? Uh, let's look at verse 5. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. There's that word predestined. That means predetermined. And it was predetermined before the foundation of the world. There's nothing ever happened that God didn't know wasn't going to happen before it happened. Now, I can't wrap my mind around that. But God knew that Adam and Eve was going to sin in the garden before they sinned in the garden. Why did he put them in the garden if he knew they was going to sin? You'll have to ask God that. I don't know. But for me to think that that was a uh-oh and God didn't know what was going to happen, I don't believe that. I believe God knew exactly what was going to happen when it happened. And God knew that he was going to have to send his son, Jesus. God knew that he was going to predestine us to be adopted as sons by Jesus Christ 
to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. And he didn't ask me anything about it. He didn't ask the Southern Baptist Convention anything about it. He didn't ask for an elder board to approve it. He said, that's my good pleasure. That's the way I'm going to do it. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to thank him Thursday morning if I'm alive and breathing and say thank you that you predestined me as adopted by your son, Jesus Christ, into your family through the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you. I have something to be thankful for because of the adoption through his son, Jesus Christ. Let's look at verse 6. He said, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Don't we become so self-righteous? He said to the praise of the glory of His grace. I think so many times, and I'm not taking anything away from the conviction of the Holy Spirit and a person saying yes to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. But if the Holy Spirit don't convict you, if God does not call upon your heart, you're not going to be saved. And I think sometimes we just think that we can just live our life and do whatever we want to do, and then when we get ready to be saved, people think, well, I'll just be saved when I get ready to be saved. No, you won't. You'll be saved when the Holy Spirit draws upon your heart and when God calls your name and says that he has called upon your heart to be saved, then you will be saved if you're willing to accept him at that time. So when he said to the praise of the glory of his grace, we need to give God the praise that one night at Sardis Church, God, by his Holy Spirit, convicted this heart of mine and I accepted what God called upon my heart to do. And he said to the praise of the glory of his grace. It was his grace, it was his son that went to the cross. It was God's love that sent his son down here to go to the cross. We have so much to be thankful for. It's not because Gary has preached for 50 years. It's not because I am a preacher. It's because of God's grace. His glory is because of why anyone has ever been saved on the face of this earth. Uh, and he needs the glory and the praise for it. And we need to get up on Thanksgiving Day and say, thank you, God, for who you are and for the grace that you have shown to each and every one of us today. Boy, oh, you're a quiet bunch today. By which he made us accepted in the beloved. Wow. That's a pretty strong verse, is it not? He made us accepted in the beloved. I think there's going to be a lot of people, a lot of church people, that are going to stand before him that's going to find out that they're not accepted in the beloved because he didn't make I think there's going to be a lot of people that's going to hear him say, depart from me. I don't know. The fruit of the tree is going to show that. And when you stand before him and hear him say, Depart from me, I never knew you. It's going to be an eternity to think about that. Because we spend so much time. I sit back, I think it was in Mark, is either Mark or Luke, where I read over there where. We talk about if a man loses his soul, gains a whole world and loses his soul. We hear that quoted over and over and over and over again. But 
just skip back one or two verses from that. That's where Jesus said, if a man wants to come after me, he's going to have to deny himself, take up his cross, follow me. We don't want to hear that. We just want to hear that a man don't want to gain the whole world and lose his own soul. But we don't want to talk about them verses before that. Because taking up a cross means we're dying to ourselves. We're going to live under His authority. We're going to do things His way. We're going to do the things that He says to do. But we don't want to hear that. But we work so hard to the praise of the glory of His grace by which He made us accepted in the beloved. Verse 7. In Him, that's Jesus, we have redemption through His blood. You look through the Old Testament and you see where they took the sacrifices of the animals, picked out the very best, sacrificed those animals year after year after year until Jesus came along. But now that don't have to be done. In Jesus we have redemption through His blood. Is that not something to be thankful for? We have forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. The riches of His grace. Oh, how thankful we ought to be for Jesus. We ought to praise Him. We ought to lift Him up. It just amazes me. It amazes me. We can get excited about everything under the sun except Jesus. Somebody can hit a three-point shot. They'll blow the top of the gym off. Somebody can hit a home run. 80-year-old grandparent that come walking up on a walker, throws a walker plumb over the field screen, runs down the side of the field, yelling at that when they hit the home run and can run the bases quicker than they can. But go to talking about Jesus and nobody gets excited. Say something about a grandpa or a grandma that's got grandkids and they'll nearly jerk their britches down and expose themselves trying to get their, grand, their grandkids' pictures out to show them. But say something about Jesus and the conversation comes to an end. And the greatest thing we have on the face of this earth is our testimony about Jesus. We have eternal value. We've got a bank account. We've got a bank account. In Jesus Christ. That no matter, no matter, according to the riches of His grace, let's be thankful. At Thanksgiving. Musicians, would you come?